Good evening to uh, this special uh, press briefing from the uh, Director General, Dr. Tedros, for, for UN accredited journalists here in, in Geneva. Uh, with this, I'll give a floor to Dr. Tedros for his opening remarks. Dr. Tedros. Thank you. Thank you, Tariq. So for uh, now, I will only say good afternoon because it's to say good afternoon. <laughs> Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome our friends from the Palais uh, back to WHO. Uh, the last time we hosted you in July last year, none of us could have imagined that almost 18 months later, uh, we would still be in the grip of the pandemic. More than 3.3 million people have lost their lives to COVID-19 this year more deaths than from HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis combined in 2020. And still, COVID-19 continues to claim around 50,000 lives every week. That's not to mention the unreported deaths and the millions of excess deaths caused by disruptions to essential health services. Africa is now facing a steep wave of infections, driven largely by the Omicron variant. Just a month ago, Africa was reporting its lowest number of cases in 18 months. Last week, it reported the fourth highest number of cases in a single week so far. There is now consistent evidence that Omicron is spreading significantly faster than the Delta variant. And it's more likely that people who have been vaccinated or have recovered from COVID-19 could be infected or reinfected. There can be no doubt that increased social mixing over the holiday period in many countries will lead to increased cases, overwhelmed health systems, and more deaths. All of us are sick of this pandemic. All of us want to spend time with friends and family. All of us want to get back to normal. The fastest way to do this is for all of us, leaders and individuals, to make the difficult decisions that must be made to protect ourselves and others. In some cases, that will mean canceling or delaying events, just as we have had to cancel the reception we plan to have with you today. But an event canceled is better than a life canceled. It's better to cancel now and celebrate later than to celebrate now and grieve later. None of us want to be here again in 12 months' time, talking about missed opportunities, continued inequity, or new variants. If we are to end the pandemic in the coming year, we must end inequity by ensuring 70% of the population of every country is vaccinated by the middle of next year. Last week, WHO issued emergency use listing for a ninth vaccine produced by the Serum Institute of India under license from Novavax. This new vaccine is part of the COVAX portfolio, and we hope that it will play an important role in achieving our global vaccination targets. As you know, COVID-19 is far from the only emergency to which WHO has responded this year. In Afghanistan, Cox's Bazar, DRC, Ethiopia, Syria, Yemen, and elsewhere, WHO is delivering humanitarian aid, supporting health systems, responding to outbreaks, and doing everything we can to save lives. And around the world, WHO is working with countries to restore and sustain essential health services disrupted by the pandemic. 
According to new data released this year, 23 million children missed out on routine vaccines in 2020. The largest number in over a decade, increasing risks from preventable diseases like measles and polio. However, five countries were able to introduce the human papillomavirus vaccine to prevent cervical cancer, and a further nine are planning to introduce it over the next six months. And in September, we launched the, a global roadmap to defeat meningitis by 2030. The pandemic has also caused setbacks in our efforts to defeat the world's leading infectious diseases. There were unestimated 14 million more malaria cases and 47,000 more malaria deaths in 2020 compared to 2019. However, WHO certified two countries, China and El Salvador, as malaria-free this year, and a further 25 are on track to end malaria transmission by 2025. This year will also be remembered for WHO's recommendation for broad use of the world's first malaria vaccine, which could save tens of thousands of children's lives every year. Services for non-communicable diseases have also been hit hard. More than half of countries surveyed between June and October this year reported disruptions to services for diabetes, cancer screening and treatment, and management of hypertension. With 2021 marking the 100th anniversary of the discovery of insulin, WHO added long-acting insulin analogs and quality-assured biosimilars to the essential medicines list paving the way for increased access and lower prices, prices for these life-saving tools. On tobacco use, we continue to see positive trends. Two years ago, only 32 countries were on track to lower tobacco use by 30% between 2010 and 2025. Now, 60 countries are on course to achieve the target reduction. On air pollution, we launched new global air quality guidelines in September with clear evidence of the damage air pollution inflicts on human health at even lower concentrations than previously known. Just last week, more than 4,500 participants at the Global Conference on Health Promotion endorsed the Geneva Charter for Wellbeing, outlining key areas of action for driving a paradigm shift in disease prevention and health promotion that, if implemented, could reduce premature mortality by 50%. And to mark International Migrants Day on Saturday, WHO has launched new standards to support countries to provide better health services to refugees and migrants. We have also taken several important steps this year to strengthen the global health architecture and WHO. We launched the WHO Hub for Pandemic and Epidemic Intelligence in Berlin. We broke ground on the WHO Academy in Lyon. We established the WHO Biohub system. Our open WHO online learning platform has now registered 6 million enrollments for courses on COVID-19 and many other health topics in 60 languages. Earlier this month, our member states agreed to negotiate a convention agreement or other international instrument on pandemic preparedness and response. And just last week, member states also discussed options for improving the sustainability and predictability of WHO's funding. We have also taken decisive steps to address instances of sexual exploitation and abuse and to make sure that our people meet the high standards 
that we and our member states expect of them. 2022 must be the year we end the pandemic, but it must also be the year that all countries invest in preventing a future disaster on this scale and in accelerating efforts to achieve the sustainable development goals. That means investing in resilient health systems built on primary health care with universal health coverage as the goal. Even before the pandemic, one billion people were spending more than 10% of their household budget on health care. When people can't access the services they need or can't afford them, individuals, families, communities, and entire societies are put at risk. In the year ahead, WHO is committed to doing everything in our power to end the pandemic and to beginning a new era in global health, an era in which health is at the center of every country's development plans. Let me end with some thanks. I thank the health workers all over the world who continue to put themselves in harm's way to serve and save others. I thank the scientists, researchers, and public health experts who continue to develop new goals, new tools against this virus and to study it. I thank you, our friends in the media, for the role you play in covering WHO, helping to get our messages out and in holding us accountable. We very much appreciate those of you who have worked to cover WHO and the pandemic fairly and accurately. Finally, I thank WHO staff all over the world who have continued to work in ways most people don't see to promote health, keep the world safe, and serve the vulnerable. I thank you. Tariq, back to you.